Let's dive pretty deeply into a job that's a good example of one of the easier projects you can do that makes a big difference in the way you feel about your home. We're going to go through the steps to retile this tub area. Check the description below for timestamps in the video that you can click on to get quickly to areas of the video you may have more interest in. I understand that some of you watching are not convinced that you or you and family members are capable of doing this renovation, but don't sell yourselves too short before watching. Keep an open mind and at least think of the possibility that you could do some of the work yourselves and rely on professionals to do some of the harder things. That in itself can save you money. If you decide ultimately to hire a contractor to do all the work, at a minimum, this video will make you a more informed homeowner who is also able to ask better questions of your contractor that may also lead to you saving money. Anyway, one reason replacing the tile around your tub is an easier project that many of you could tackle is because you're dealing with a small space, typically a three foot by five foot minimum area. And if you replace the wallboard and tile in this area, your bathroom already has a major facelift. I can hear some of you already saying, Rusty, I've got a tub just like that, or worse yet, I've got the tub that looks like an avocado. How did you get your tub to turn white all of a sudden? And you'd be right, it's not magic. If you don't have the manpower to get the tub out, then remove everything except the tub and get a plumber to pull the old one and set a new one. If you do have the people to help you, then you just need to remove the stuff you need to remove to get the tub out. The tub is connected to the plumbing at the drain and, in most cases, is pretty much just sitting there on the floor otherwise. Maybe screwed to the studs in some cases, depending on the type of tub it is. In this situation, Ryan and I had to take a saw to the studs right here because we had to tilt the tub forward to get it out of this pretty confined space. And since it was cast iron and weighed about 300 pounds, that was a little tricky. The tub could have been busted out with a sledgehammer, but you still have the challenge to get a new tub into that space. So we typically try to just remove the tub in one piece and then figure out the installation challenges of the new tub in the process. Once you get the old tile and wallboard torn out, the original framing gives you about a half an inch or so to shift the tub around to try to get it out. Literally the biggest issue for us was the weight of the tub but it took us probably 30 minutes to do what we needed to do to get the tub moved. It's always a good idea at this point to bring the plumbing up to date by swapping out the old water valve. This is a very typical plumbing setup where you have one half inch copper water supply lines coming up through the floor to supply your tub and shower valve. The first thing I do on any remodel is to put shutoff valves on these water lines. One reason is you only have to shut the water off to the whole house for a few minutes to install these valves and then the water is back on to the rest of the house. You need to check your local plumbing codes but these days these push on valves are available in any of the major home improvement stores. I'll make a mark about an inch from the end of my pipe and once the valve is pushed in place I can see the mark relative to the position of the valve and know it's fully in place. They're very easy to install and I've never had a problem with one. The main thing you want to do is make sure you get the valves inserted completely on the pipe. Following the instructions that come with your new shower tub valve along with asking questions as needed from your local hardware store or home center, you should be able to get the valve installed okay. If you're not quite sure, you can always call a plumber to take care of this part. When it comes to adding back your backer board, there are many options to choose from. I personally would stay away from the foam board products, which is just a preference thing for me. They're really lightweight to work with and easy to cut, but they're flimsy in between the studs, and while that's probably not going to be a problem after the tile is installed, I just don't like the feel of it. I have no sponsorship relationships with anyone, so any products I mention, I just mention them. My go-to backer board material is Half Inch Hardy Backer. It mimics the old style mud shower walls in that it absorbs random moisture that's worked its way through the grout joints over time and it's not damaged by water. The hardy backer comes in three by five foot sheets, which typically means on the tub surround like this, one full sheet can be added to the back wall as a starting point. Then screws are added per code requirements in your area or based on the instruction sheets that may be available when you purchase it. I use an angle grinder with a tile cutting blade on it, and though it's dusty making the cuts, it's also a very effective and easy way to make these cuts. Now once the hardy backer is in place, I do some waterproofing of the surface in the areas where I've drilled through the hardy backer and also at the seams and the corners. 
There's another school of thought, though, that suggests that the better way to go is to waterproof the entire surface of the hardybacker. The concern I have with that is that over time, invariably, some amount of water is going to make its way through the grout joints and get into that area between the tile and the waterproof membrane. And what happens to it then? I've yet to hear a good explanation as to how that does not ultimately lead to mold problems. As I mentioned earlier, the properties of hardybacker remind me of the old mud wall installations, and I prefer that the hardybacker deal with the potential water issues by wicking and dispersing the moisture away. That said, I think as long as the grout joints and caulk joints are maintained consistently over time, either method will give you long-lasting results. You see the laser line that I'm using to help me with the layout before I start setting tile, but you don't have to have one of these. For many years, I used a four foot and a two foot level to lay out all my tile jobs. But these laser levels are so inexpensive these days that if you do any type of consistent remodeling or renovation work around your house, you can definitely justify the cost of having one. I think this unit cost about $80. With the laser, I'm projecting the top of my first row of tile above the tub, and the laser allows me to wrap that line all the way around the bathroom at one time, including the area to the left here, which is going to have a wainscot that covers both these walls. With that laser line, I can pretty accurately figure out the placement of every tile that I will set on this job before I ever install a single piece of tile. That should tell you how important the layout process is and the overall quality of the installation that you'll end up with. When setting tile, the real difference between a great job and a very average or poor job is when there are no obvious mistakes in the layout because you've anticipated and addressed every potential problem you could encounter. It's really not that hard to do, and yet I run across jobs all the time where the installers obviously did not put very much thought into their layout. I'm using 12 inch by 24 inch porcelain tile with three inch by 12 inch bullnose trim to finish the edges. I'm also going to be wrapping the tile around these two left walls up to a height of about 32 inches including the trim, so there are a number of things to consider before I make final decisions on the layout. The tile around the tub is going to run all the way up to the ceiling and is going to have a decorative band of two rows of 2x2 two two tile up around the level of the shower head. In the real installation I have two niches for shampoo and soap bottles to tile and I do take them into consideration on the layout, but if you hang around to the end of the video, I'll cover how I made them out of hardybacker also. Because the tile runs all the way to the floor on the left side, it would be nice if I could start the tile at the floor level with a full piece. It doesn't have to be that way, but if it works out with carrying that level line all the way around the tub, that would be great. This animation is the actual layout I used drawn to scale for this job. Because I took the time to figure out a layout that would work best for this circumstance, I saved myself a lot of time and frustration. With one row of tile set around the tub, I had pretty well assured myself of a really good looking finish with only minor tweaks required to keep things on track. I'm going to take you step by step through my decision making process on this layout and give you my opinion on the most important things to keep in mind in doing tile work like this. So if you don't remember anything else from this video, remember this. The key to it all is level lines and plumb lines, as represented by my laser lines in this drawing. It's true for tile work and most other construction trades that you learn. If you keep your lines level and plumb and your layout square, you will greatly reduce the problems you have. As I began working on the layout, the first idea was starting a full tile at floor level as a potential good way to establish my first level line around the tub. Since I'm going roughly 32 inches up the side wall with tile, I thought I would try this type of layout rather than something like a full tile on the tub to see how it worked out, but ultimately the main decision making factor for me is going to be how this works out around the tub, and then with some consideration as to how it's going to work out once we get to the ceiling. So with this layout as a possibility, I moved to the tub to check things out there. Since I'm using a larger format tile which creates its own set of issues to be aware of, I start with the back wall to begin the layout. I run a line from the tub to the ceiling in the exact center of the back wall. I like my tile installations to be symmetrical if possible, so it makes sense to look at the center line. I can either start with the grout joint on that line, or I can center the piece of tile on that line, and either way, it will give me good symmetry and allow the cuts to be close to the same when I get to each wall. 
At this point, I decided to start the edge of the tile at the center line to help me with the cuts at the niches later. On each sidewall, I do pretty much the same thing to figure out the layout of the tile. Here I have a piece of bullnose trim that's helping to wrap the corner, and I prefer it to be on the tub side of the wall so its position is locked in and everything else has to work around it. The only thing that's not great about this, though, is this small cut right here. But sometimes that's just the way things work out and you need to make those cuts. A tile saw makes it easy and without one it gets a little more challenging. But tile saws are pretty available to rent these days and it may be worth the cost for a few days. The right side layout is pretty simple and the only things I need to be concerned about are placing the tile for the wainscot so that the door trim will butt up against it once it's installed and leaving myself plenty of tile to work with when I make cuts as the tile is set up the wall to the ceiling. I've already said I like the idea of starting with a full tile at the floor and then carrying that line all the way around the bathroom. That means I will have a cut to make against the tub. In this case, both the real tub and fake tub are almost exactly level all the way around. In the real world, that doesn't always happen, so here's how you deal with that. I generally like to have a cut against the tub anyway and prefer that cut to be at least a half inch to an inch depending on the size of the tile. But let's pretend that this tub is not level and we decide to start with a full tile on the tub but pick the high point on the tub rather than the low point to begin setting tile. Here's what happens. As long as we keep the tile running level with each new row, everything looks pretty good. But when we look at tub level, we have a pretty good joint at the tub and tile intersection at the right side where we put our first piece of tile down, but on the left we have about a 3 8 inch gap between the tub and the tile. Most of the time when this happens, people will fill it with grout or caulk and it looks terrible. Let's say this time we forget about a level line and use the tub as our level line, which we know is not level. That's going to lead to equally bad results, and as we continue setting tile up the wall, we find it's impossible to keep all the corners lined up. So the point is always keep yourself committed to following level lines when you're setting wall tile. If your tub is out of level, start at the low point and even maybe take another inch off your cut to keep you out of trouble as you begin stacking tile up the wall. Let me mention a couple of other things about installing tile. When troweling thin set onto hardy backer in particular, be aware that the hardy backer will begin pulling the moisture out of the thin set immediately. As a result of that, I always put a thin layer of thin set on the back of the tile or back butter before putting a piece of tile on the wall. More information is available on other channels about specifics of applying thin set and you can get as technical and into the weeds as you want by checking out these other videos. My recommendation is to think about it logically and realize that if you get close to 100% coverage and contact of your tile and the hardy backer and press the tile into that bed of thin set, it's not going anywhere until you or someone else comes along and decides to tear it off again. I also use these plastic spacers that are beveled and are great for aligning tile as you're installing. Also I use these leveling systems at times, particularly with setting larger tile. Their purpose is to pull tile edges into alignment with each other and help reduce edges of tile sticking out beyond edges on adjoining pieces. This happens because of height variations on the surface you are setting tile on. On these niches for shampoo and soap bottles, my biggest concern is that they be waterproof because they're recessed into the wall. And so I use plenty of fiberglass tape and waterproof membrane like Hydroban in this case to make them waterproof. For these niches, I took pieces of solid surface countertop material to use as the bottoms, but most of the time the bottoms are covered with tile. Always make sure that the bottom piece, whatever it is, has a pitch on it so that when water collects on it, the water will make its way back into the tub area. As far as making these boxes, I cut pieces of one half inch hardy backer for the sides and back, and essentially am making a drawer. I use silicone caulk as the adhesive, and pre-drill holes in the sides and back to screw the pieces together while the silicone caulk sets up. Then after adding fiberglass tape and waterproofing them, they are put in place and screwed into studs with more fiberglass tape and waterproofing added.